Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Hello and welcome, I'm Jo Carlo, a freelance journalist with a specialism in psychology. Today I'm with consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist Dr Anon Bentoven, founder of the Child and Family Practice in London. Dr Bentoven will be speaking at the Jack Tizard Memorial Lecture and National Conference at that ACAM, the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, is holding in June, which focuses on helping young people in crisis. Welcome, Anon. Can you start by introducing yourself? Yes. Um, so, I'm Arnon Bentovim and I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and um, I've been in the field <laughs> quite a long time because um, I qualified literally the same year that the uh, ACAMH was founded and I began my child and adolescent psychiatric training at the Maudsley mm -hmm. a few years later and became a member of this association at that time because it was uh, the association to be a member of if you were interested in this field. Um, although I trained at the Maudsley, I was interested in dynamic approaches, so I then moved to Great Ormond Street, uh, which was rather more dynamic in its orientation, started an analytic training, which was uh, what child and adolescent psychiatrists did in those days. But in the 60s, <clears throat> I soon got caught up in the family therapy mm -hmm. uh, revolution and together with colleagues in London founded the Association uh, for Family Therapy and the Institute of Family Therapy. So I was continuing with these two streams, mm -hmm. my analytic work and the, and the um, uh, systemic yep. ideas, and try to keep them uh, both going. And then when I was appointed at Great Ormond Street in 1968, being the newly appointed consultant, I was asked, would I become part of the newly formed child protection group? Mm -hmm. Because having, uh, because in the light of Henry Kemp's well-known paper on the battered child syndrome at the hospital at Great Ormond Street, it was felt we should be aware and involved. And so I began in parallel to my work with analytic and family systemic thinking to become involved in the child protection field. And we established um, a number of services at Great Ormond Street over the year, years. Uh, we formed a, a Trauma X unit, which was a, a sort of unit that was concerned about uh, looking at and being aware of children in the, admitted to the hospital mm. where there was, it was clear that there had been evidence of abuse and we were involved in a number of interesting developments, particularly um, uh, that of uh, Munchausen by proxy and seeing children and young people were, who'd been induced into illness states in the hospital. Mm. And in parallel, uh, we also began uh, services in our department for children and families where to just really begin to develop a treatment approach right. for children and families where they'd been identified as abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. Uh, and then in the, uh, in the 70s, we became involved uh, in uh, assessment of children mm -hmm. who'd been sexually abused. And we uh, ran a, started running a therapeutic, probably the first therapeutic service uh, in Europe, actually, for working with different groups of children, young children, older children, adolescents who'd been sexually abused. Together with Eileen Vizard, we began work with young people who uh, were offending, mm -hmm. and then also working with parents and parent groups and working uh, with, um, actually working with, with adults, particularly where they had abused children, mm -hmm. so we could actually begin the therapeutic work with them and begin to look at whether the sort of family systemic ideas mm -hmm. could move towards some sort of resolution of abusive uh, experiences and abusive actions. So we 
published a number of papers on that mm -hmm. and then got involved with research on trying to understand the origins of sexually harmful behaviour. So that really took me through uh, my career at Great Ormond Street with the development to, of a service uh, to look at complex situations mm -hmm. to help the courts make decisions uh, when children had been harmed, whether there was a prospect uh, of them returning home, mm -hmm. whether they needed alternative care. So right. we got very much involved in that whole, uh, in that whole field. Can I ask what prompted your interest in the first place? Well, it, interestingly, it was when I was doing my medical school uh, training, I got very interested in paediatrics. Mm -hmm. And when I did a paediatrics house job at St. Thomas's, um, I began to see the way in which children's health states fluctuated so markedly mm. in the presence of family members and began to see the family interactive aspects right. to do with child health. So that in a sense that propelled me towards mental health and also then uh, to decide to specialise in child and adolescent mental health, which at that time in the six, early 60s uh, was very much a new area. Mike mm. Rutter had just been appointed uh, at, at the Maudsley and I worked uh, on his team in part. So it was very much that time. You founded the Child and Family Practice with your wife Marianne. Can you say a little about the types of cases that you handle within your practice? Sure. Well, I retired after my 30, almost 30 years at the hospital uh, in 1994 and decided, because I had always done some independent practice, both in terms of, of court uh, assessments and also uh, working with, with children and families, and I decided that I didn't want to go into, into solitary splendor in a consulting room right. in Harley Street. <laughs> okay. So instead of that, uh, we decided that we would found an independent mm -hmm. practice. And um, that has really since, uh, that's really grown very significantly. Right. And it's now in Bloomsbury and has about 40 or 50 independent practitioners working. And we tried to establish a team, uh, a multidisciplinary mm -hmm. team, because London is such a major yeah. centre for health and for families and, uh, and children and families. We established a service with paediatricians, neurologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, uh, therapists, to try to offer an independent service. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, and more recently, uh, although I've now uh, not no longer practising there, they've established a charitable foundation to try to ensure that children and families can be offered therapeutic work in the independent sector. Right. And there's a child and family training component. Can you tell me a little bit about the training aspect? Yes. Well, in 2000, um, the Department for Health, um, subsequently Department for Education, um, got very interested in establishing the assessment framework uh, for, uh, for children in need and their families, uh, which I consulted to. And um, that was uh, an approach which tried to ensure that children within the welfare uh, service and uh, related services would have a holistic approach. In other words, uh, their parenting would be assessed, the uh, needs of the children, the family and community factors, the triangle. And so myself and, and Professor Tony Cox from Guys, we were commissioned with colleagues to develop a series of evidence-based approaches to help practitioners across the field carry out evidence-based assessments mm -hmm. with children, with parents and families. And we then established child and family training uh, together with other colleagues to train those approaches which we had developed. And so we developed approaches to working based on the research we did at Great Ormond Street and, and the Institute of Child Health on family assessment. We introduced a training uh, in family assessment. Uh, we also included and we were funded to produce a set of uh, video training material, which I'm going to uh, be using in my presentation, um, to work to, to make assessments of the environment of care, the home environment of mm -hmm. care. And then we <clears throat> developed a framework 
uh, for safeguarding assessment when there were complex court cases based on the work that we did. And the most recent development has been the intervention resources, which I'm going to be speaking about uh, in my presentation. I want to talk about um, interventions for pre preventing harm from adverse childhood experiences, or ACEDs. And the research seems to suggest that interventions are often too reliant on one modality or other, so yes. for example CBT or a psychodynamic approach. Also that children affected by several ACEs or those with comorbidities are not always well served. Is that, have I understood that correctly? Yes, that's, that, that's absolutely okay. correct. I mean, <clears throat> we're very concerned about the phenomenon of polyvictimization. Mm -hmm. Uh, work by David Finkelhor and his colleagues in, 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 um, in the States, which demonstrated that, um, that a significant number of children were affected by more than one form of harmful uh, abuse. They were yeah. sexually abused and rejected, and uh, also there may be physical abuse and uh, other forms of abuse, mm -hmm. and that the more of these different forms of abuse the child and young person experience, the more likely they were to show extreme harm. Right. And of course, in teenage life, around the age of 14, to flip into aggressive, uh, harming others mm -hmm. uh, as a response to uh, experiences of abuse and an externalizing mm -hmm. approach. The sort of approach that we noticed in our research right. on trying to understand the origins of children who displayed mm -hmm. harmful sexual behavior. So, with this interest in polyvictimization, multiple forms of uh, abuse, uh, of course, you link that to the fact of interest in uh, adverse childhood experiences, mm -hmm. which adds to the basic forms of abuse, uh, physical, emotional, sexual, neglect, exposure to violence, mm -hmm. other harmful experiences such as having a parent um, who's got ser serious mental health problems or substance abuse or has been incarcerated. So this idea of having mental health leads in schools, some of the recent Green Paper transforming mental health services, that's something you support as a... Yes, I mean, I, I mean I've, we've, I feel that um, one of the powerful uh, benefits of the modular approach, which mm -hmm. we're obviously very interested in developing, is that it can provide skills for practitioners at all levels. Mm -hmm. And in our piloting, the people who found uh, it most helpful because it gave uh, steps to carry out an intervention were those who were very experienced, knew children well, had worked with them but had never had a training or right. never, had a, never had a qualification, but could use these approaches. Mm -hmm. And I think the notion of having uh, an approach which can be utilized as resources by practitioners at all levels, mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are, of course, when in the child and adolescent mental health field, when we have children with highly complex disorders, mm -hmm. they're going to need the most specialist yeah, help. But it would make a tremendous difference if more practitioners had more skills yeah. so that, in a sense, there could be early intervention. Mm. And it's interesting that the government is currently very interested in a national early intervention uh, um, process uh, uh, approach to deal with adversity. And having a broad range of intervention resources mm -hmm. could be a helpful way of right. achieving that goal. When looking to safeguard children who are living with trauma and family violence, what are the key considerations in ensuring that one does right by the child? Well, <clears throat> the, the model which we've developed at Child and Family Training um, is an approach which I think is helpful could be helpful, because we feel that there's a seven stages that people need to be aware of, because the first stage is recognizing there is a problem, mm -hmm. that a child might be being harmed, uh, might need protecting, might need safety. But the second stage is to carry out a broad-based holistic assessment of the child mm -hmm. and family, 
uh, to understand using our triangle of what are the factors in parenting, what are the strengths, what are the difficulties, what are the factors in the parent which might be played out mm -hmm. in relationship to the children, what are the needs of the children across their uh, across their health, across nutrition, across their well-being, across emotional health, across attachments, what are the needs of the children, to, and then to be able to analyze and see the patterns mm. and make a prediction of what's going to happen here, what are the yeah. strengths that might help the child, what are the difficulties that's going to mean that the problems are going to escalate, so that we can actually say, well, what's the likelihood of continuing harm here? Mm. What's the potential to help the family? Where are the strengths that we need to build on? Where are the difficulties that we need to target? And then what are the resources we need yeah. to do that? Um, and I think that's the general approach we need to take, in other words, to make it, to, to look at, to assess, to bring information together, to analyze it, uh, to make a prediction of what's going to happen, and then either say this is a family where, where there's such severity of abuse, where there's such intransigence, where there's such problems of the parental mental health or personality disorders, that it's unlikely we're going to help those parents in the child's time frame. Mm -hmm. I used to have, when I went to court, I used to have one, uh, something I would often say to the, uh, to the judges, look, I appreciate the parents are really want to help their children. Mm -hmm. They really have an intention to deal with their problems of addiction or their problems of mental health or their problems of, of, of poor caring capacities, but the mountain's too high right. to climb. And I think in this instance, the child really needs alternative care. Or I would, uh, so I think that's a very important sort of framework to think mm -hmm. about how to make children safe. One of your research projects in collaboration with the Institute of Child Health is longitudinal research on factors associated with the development of sexually abusive behaviour in young people. Can you share some of your findings? Yes. Um, <laughs> it was just, these projects often start in a rather serendipitous way. Um, when we uh, started our sexual abuse project mm -hmm. at, the, at the hospital, uh, I can't quite remember why, but we kept all the files in, uh, in a set of filing cabinets right. in one of the uh, in, in our department. So we actually had all the notes right. that we'd ever of the, case, of the children. So we thought, well, it might be a good idea to, to look at the boys who were, uh, that we'd seen for treatment, right. and there may be three-year-olds, six-year-olds, eight-year-olds, <laughs> nine-year-olds, uh, who'd been abused. Obviously, a smaller proportion of boys are abused than mm -hmm. girls, but boys are more responsible for sexually harmful behavior, but not exclusively. <clears throat> so we actually followed those boys up in towards their uh, adult life and used ways of looking through the courts, or looking through social services, to track what had happened right. to them. What was the time? Oh, yeah. about 10, 15 years, right. something like that. So they were teenagers mm -hmm. or young adults at the time. And uh, I don't know whether we'd be able to do it now, but we were able right. to, there we got permission. And we looked at what were the factors um, in the, at the time in their childhood that seemed to have an influence about which direction they would go. Mm -hmm. Uh, we would have hoped that maybe our treatment might have made a difference, but that was because it wasn't designed in that sort of way. Uh, that was more difficult to tell. But what was interesting, it was those boys who, as well as being sexually abused, had also been exposed to violence, to harmful uh, uh, responses mm -hmm. towards their mothers, towards women, mm -hmm. females perhaps, important point, had been neglected and rejected uh, in other words, these were boys who had been subject to multiple ACEs. I want to look at some of the interventions that appear to be successful with young people with a history of offending behaviour. Yes. And I'm wondering if, if the disruptive, innovative approach that you described earlier, is that something that's shown to be effective? Yes. Uh, and... Um the modular approach which we've, uh, which we've developed, which is a disruptive, innovative approach, um, one of the guides 
which we developed uh, together with my colleagues at the Faithful Foundation. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, uh, one of the tasks I've had, I've been chair of the trustees at the Lucy Faithful Foundation, which is an organization which is concerned to work uh, to, to, to um, ch protect children by ensuring that individuals who have offended have appropriate intervention. Mm -hmm. And so together with the Faithful Foundation and Hilary Eldridge, um, uh, we actually did the research which included looking for the common elements that, uh, that were utilized in work with young people who'd offended. And one of, the guide, one of our guides, uh, which focuses on child sexual abuse, has work both with children who've been abused and also uh, children and adolescents who've been responsible for sexually harmful yeah. behavior. So we have <laughs> utilized the, the modular approach to work with those children and young people now. And that's been a very interesting development. Okay. And how widespread is the use of the modular approach? Well, it's um, in we've just in in recent in recent years we've have uh, done a total um, re-edit in the light of the piloting and the work we've done, and um, they they have, many people have been interested to purchase, and some training has arisen from that because we've taken the view that the guides that an, a, 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 a practitioner could train themselves yeah. because it has, the, it has the steps, it has the scripts, it has the worksheets, but that training is even better. Yeah. Uh, and many people have purchased, and particularly a great deal of interest in working with, tra with emotional and traumatic responses, mm. uh, as well as positive parents. Right. In other words, uh, how can I deal with challenging behavior? So uh, beginning to be interested and then mm. training in some of the guides and then more general training. Mm. And, and how can you ensure you disseminate these ideas more widely? Well, it's, it's uh, fantastic to have the opportunity to share this thinking in the Jack Tizard right. Memorial uh, meeting and I'm delighted to have the opportunity and we, we obviously present in, uh, in conferences mm -hmm. uh, here uh, and we've very, got very strong links uh, with the British uh, Association uh, for the Study of Child Abuse and Neglect now called the Association of Child Protection mm -hmm. Professionals and we have uh, we have a partnership to right. uh, provide workshops um, and we provide workshops uh, in, in other countries too. So we try to ensure that, uh, that as many people know about it and beginning to work with the people in the States who developed uh, the match, the modular approach to, uh, to see whether the approach which we developed might be relevant um, for the, the folk in North America as well. You're working to integrate common treatment elements and procedures into a coordinated framework. Can you say more about this? I think that the way in which we're looking at it now is to say that <clears throat> we need to take an area, for example, interventions following abuse and neglect mm -hmm. or interventions for looked after children who are in local authority care or in foster care, care interventions for children who've been exposed to domestic violence, um, interventions for sexual abuse, interventions for uh, ACEs. So what we've, ten what we've done is to take these particular practice areas and say, so what's the basic thinking about how to approach the work there, and then how can we uh, fit the sort of uh, modular mm -hmm. modules which we've developed yes. and, to, and in, integrate it into a training that's going to help practitioners work with those sorts of problems, so that um, <clears throat> it may well be uh, that if we're working with foster carers, uh, for the care of children who may have been abused uh, mm -hmm. in their previous care, that those foster carers and those supporting them are going to need help, um, particularly positive parenting, because mm -hmm. 
uh, they're going to behave in a challenging way and they need to systematically find ways to praise, to reward, to manage challenging behavior. Uh, they're also going to need uh, uh, help specifically about dealing with disruptive behavior mm. and working with children and young people to uh, we have a notion of finding a new life, helping young people behaving in a challenging way by creating uh, a different mindset about their futures and helping them manage their own anger and aggression as well as the parent. Or if there are anxiety, if there's traumatic responses, to help build trauma narratives. So what we're trying to do is to say which of the modules are going to be particularly relevant for this particular piece of work. And then uh, I've, I've also look, we've also looked at children with basic mental health problems, anxiety, depression, uh, trauma, conduct. Because we have the match built into uh, our approach, then we can work out, well, which modules would it be helpful to work with, with anxiety, children or anxiety, ang who are both anxious and depressed and showing some challenging behavior. In other words, the comorbid problems mm -hmm. uh, in, in everyday mental health uh, practice. Right. So some of the training is, say, with foster parents, for example? It could be, it would be with, with foster carers and their support workers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's quite feasible that foster, parent, foster carers may well be involved in the therapeutic work mm -hmm. because some of the approaches are with children directly, yeah. sometimes with parents and children together, sometimes with the whole family. Yeah. In other words, it depends on the context. Yeah. So it, the main thing is that it's really joined up. It's joined up, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit more about the development for child and family training? Yes, so I think that <laughs> over the since 2000, since we were established, we've developed approaches, um, assessment approaches, analysis approaches, and now the intervention process mm -hmm. approaches. And I think that what we're interested in further development is to tailor um, the approaches that we've developed for a whole range of, of problems and difficulties. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we see the future to really try to say uh, and, and how best to train. Yes. Uh, for example, we find that it's very helpful to use an approach where we do a workshop with a set of trainees and then we have a coaching session. Okay. So we help them in detail with the particular cases they're working with, particular children, particular families mm -hmm. and how to go about it and how to use the material. Right. What are the new developments or research or in the pipeline that Pique your interest. Well, we live in we live in fascinating times, don't we? And every time I look at the uh, the journal of the ACMH, I'm always uh, very interested to see the way in which basic genetic uh, developments, mm. um, the neurobiological developments, the whole issues of environment and mm. uh, genetic factors and neurobiology and how that relates to psychological functioning. Mm. I'm very interested, for example, um, about the, the work, the, the work uh, in the neurobiology field that says that the different uh, forms of stress that children, young people, uh, actually have an impact on their nature, the, mm. what teacher calls the echophenotype, and that in a sense there's a change. Uh, and what we see is the way in which these children and young people have earlier, uh, that they, 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 they begin uh, to, to show harmful responses earlier, to mental health responses, mm. or challenging behavior earlier, and that there is a real shift. So mm -hmm. I think the whole, um, the whole understanding of biology, the understanding of, of basic psychological processes is so fascinating. Mm. You're presenting at the Jack Tizard Memorial Lecture and yes. National Conference in June. Um, it feels pertinent to mention that you worked with Jack Tizard. Can well, you say a little bit about Yes. <laughs> well, one of the great experiences for me as a trainee uh, was to be an interviewer on the famous Isle of Wight uh, study, epidemiological study, which Jack 
uh, carried out with Michael Rutter and Philip Graham, um, Kingsley Whitmore, and I visited the island on two, three occasions to carry out interviews. And of course, uh, Jack and Mike and Philip and so on were there. So it was a great pleasure to have uh, that interchange with them whilst we were doing, uh, doing our assessments. You've probably covered some of this already, but can you give a sort of brief summary of some of the areas that you plan to address during your talk at the National Conference? Yes, well I want to emphasise that complexity and multiple problems are the rule rather than the exception. Mm -hmm. I want to demonstrate the way in which these experiences have a transdiagnostic effect on children and young people's mental health and I want to talk about the way in which uh, a modular approach could be a helpful solution mm -hmm. to deal with complexity because of the focus both on the parent, the child and the family. And then to use one of our case, uh, one, one of our video case examples just to demonstrate briefly what I mean right. and how it would work. So uh, that's what I hope to cover. Great. Is there anything you'd like to add that I haven't asked or perhaps as a takeaway message for those listening or watching? Well, I, I, it's, I would just say that um, it's been uh, an enormous privilege to be part of the community, to have come to meetings at the ACMH over the years, uh, and I was, when Mike Rutter was the um, <clears throat> chair, I was on his committee, so I was for a, a while involved with understanding the whole process of how it works and have tremendous admiration for what the association is doing currently and I'm enormously uh, privileged to take part and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity. Anand, thank you very much for your time. Dr Anon Bentovin will be speaking at the Jack Tizard Memorial Lecture and ACAM National Conference Helping Young People in Crisis, Gender Identity, Personality Problems and Complex Trauma, which takes place in London in June, on June the 14th. More information is available on the ACAM website, www.acam.org and Twitter at ACAM. ACAM is spelt A-C-A-M-H. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.